Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. If not, I can shout louder. That's not a problem. Um, so I'm Divya Mohan, and uh, the least that I can say is that I'm extremely honored because I really am to be speaking at the Emerging OS Forum at the Open Source Summit today. So. I'll be speaking about the WebAssembly landscape, but we'll get to that in a bit because I realize that I have not introduced myself and honestly speaking, I don't think a lot of you all know me. So I'm a technical writer with SUSA and uh, I'm also an advisor to Avesha. Um, over and about the open source work that I do at my day job, I'm also heavily involved in the cloud native ecosystem as a docs maintainer on the Kubernetes as well as the Litmus Chaos projects. And um, funnily, the cloud native ecosystem is how I stumbled upon into, you know, the WebAssembly ecosystem as well. And I promise that this was not like uh, an intended uh, segue, but uh, I'm going to take it. Uh, so uh, if you're like absolutely, absolutely, um, you know, into Marvel or DC Comics or any franchise for that matter, you'd probably know that uh, the villain or the superhero actually has an origin story. Um, it basically tells, uh, it basically sets the context really of how uh, they got their powers and how they rose to, uh, you know, the, f the fame or the infamy um, and how they conquered. So basically, um, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing, a bit of context setting for WebAssembly. Um, and let's, you know, have a look at that. Now, this is a no brainer because WebAssembly has the name web in it. So, um, it started right at the origin, uh, of the internet, which was back in the 1990s. Um, and, uh, if you look at the page here, this is like the first page of the internet for those who don't know. Um, and, um, you'll see that. This doesn't have like a lot of interactivity and the dynamism that we've come to associate with the web. And we kind of take that for granted. Um, but what the internet essentially started out was a document sharing network uh, for among, you know, folks at Sun. So that's of course till JavaScript came into the picture uh, a few years later. A programming language that was written for the web, JavaScript was made available in the year 1995, if I've not gotten my math and my timelines wrong. And it's ever since become a member of the holy trifecta of the web, that is um, uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So um, it's, um, you know, in order to introduce more dynamism, JavaScript wasn't alone in its venture. We also had plugins like Flash and Silverlight come into the picture. Now, um, I know we were going, uh, you know, I was going to talk about WebAssembly, but this is like a little bit of heavy context setting. Um, plugins were required um, and introduced a few years uh, later as a way to um, contest maybe uh, the rise of JavaScript and, you know, in, in the quest to bring dynamism to the web. For uh, those of you in the audience who don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are none um, uh, who don't know what plugins were. Uh, they were downloadable software that could be used to view multimedia content, um, stream audio, video, and execute rich applications such as, um, uh, you know, uh, games on the web um, during the early internet uh, days, of course. But I digressed a bit there uh, because we're here to understand more about WebAssembly and why it came into the picture. So what exactly was the problem with JavaScript and these plugin things? Um, well, when it came to JavaScript, what ended up happening was that because it was so widely accepted and uh, the entry level barrier was low. Um, I don't know who said that, but anybody who works with JavaScript right now does not really think that. Um, uh, the entry level barrier was low. It ended up becoming a sort of de facto programming language, which is fine. But it also ended up becoming the de facto compilation target, which meant that any 
language, uh, any application written in any language, if you needed to bring it to the web, you need, it, you need to necessarily compile it um, to JavaScript. And this wasn't super optimal given that JavaScript wasn't designed to be a compilation target in the very first place. Um, additionally, when we talk about performance intensive applications like um, say your Figma or your Photoshop um, or an application running an AI ML workload, um, these started throwing up glaring inconsistencies in performance. Um, we're all technologists here, so I'm not really, you know, going to go into the details of what is a strongly typed uh, language and what is a weakly typed language. Um, but being a weakly typed language gave JavaScript as many drawbacks as the benefits. And the competition wasn't really that great uh, from the plugin side of things because it was a downloadable software and anybody who has used plugins knows the amount of viruses that came along with it. So it was a massive security nightmare. And the compatibility of these plugins across devices um, or operating systems didn't really help their case either. So as it stands today, uh, Flash by Adobe and Microsoft Silverlight uh, stand discontinued in terms of usage. And uh, our quest for alternatives uh, began, you know, way back then and uh, with all these problems in our head. So there were a number of efforts um, underway which led to the, you know, cropping up of the ASM.js specification. One of them uh, being the introduction of Rust, then uh, other being the uh, mscript and initiative. Um, but it was the ASM.js specification that made its way uh, into the ecosystem nine years ago, uh, moving us one step closer to WebAssembly as we know it today. So what is the ASM.js specification? Um, I've borrowed this because I think it's a very cool slide that was presented um, in the Cloud Native uh, WebAssembly day. Uh, it's by Bailey Hayes. You should definitely go check her talk out as well because it was a fantastic keynote. Um, it's uh, she called it the greatest hack ever. And I, I kind of tend to agree with her um, because ASM.js is basically a strictly typed subset of J JavaScript. Um, a couple of slides back when we spoke about disadvantages of JavaScript, I talked about weak typing being one of them. With ASM.js, only top level named functions and simple constructs were allowed. Again, throwing back to a slide I showed before, there was the whole process of compiling to JavaScript, which was a major hindrance for bringing applications written in other languages onto the web. ASM.js leverages the mscripten uh, uh, compiler, that's LLVM uh, CLang based for transpiling C or C++ code into ASM.js. Um, now, obviously, um, this was crap too because we're talking about WebAssembly. Uh, why was that the case? So the ASM.js spec was a disjointed effort. And by disjointed, I mean that um, one set of folks were already working on the uh, ASM.js specification, but there were other initiatives like the native client and the portable native client initiatives by Google um, to bring languages like C++, C to the front end. Um, although there was an eventual convergence, uh, with all these efforts uh, being, you know, um, taken up by different industry folks, um, there was a recognition that um, there is a need for standardization with respect to, uh, you know, this direction. So that's how uh, circa 2015 uh, WebAssembly was announced as a standard. Now, uh, the initial implementation was based on the feature set of ASM.js and the MVP that uh, was announced in 2017. And it's still what we're working with today. Uh, the public working draft was announced, I think, a couple of months back, I think April, uh, for the second version, but uh, it's just a draft. Uh, it's not, you know, nothing's there yet. Um, but let's, let's take a step back. What on earth is WebAssembly? Uh, it's kind of a misnomer at this point, given that it's neither web nor assembly, uh, uh, you know, neither 
it's it, it caters to the web sure but it's not exactly assembly level language um at its core it's basically a compilation target and uh, this means that it's basically more um machine friendly than human friendly uh, in the sense that the output is that of a compiler and it will be in the binary code format so when you're speaking about something that's there in the binary code format you unless you are an extreme enthusiast in the space you will not be interested in going through the um, you know reams of pages you get as output so uh, we have a textual format within the web assembly uh, ecosystem to complement that so that you know if you're an enthusiast or if you are actually um, you know interested in writing compilers and stuff like that um, you can use that um, like i said before it's um, you know it was designed for the web initially but it has extended its reach far um, beyond to the server side and other environments as well we'll see that in a couple of slides though um so yeah i mentioned that web assembly typically has a binary code format right and some of you must be wondering how on earth do we actually end up writing real world applications or leveraging it for real world applications uh primarily because achieving a lot of the frills and fancies that we have with uh, real world applications um involves networking it involves accessing memory bunch of other functions and web assembly as a specification and you know the core spec does not uh, simply allow for that which is why the next section of the presentation here will be dealing with the wider ecosystem which is the um, component model um, including the component model uh, the wasi spec and you know folks uh, and projects involved in the space so um but before we dive into the wasi spec uh, which is a specification for the web assembly system interface um this is what solomon hikes who's the uh, founder of and cto of docker docker had to say about it um when we started out as an industry uh, we were heavily reliant on our um, you know physical machines we used to run applications on them in fact the um first web page that i showed right at the start of the presentation ran on a next computer at cern um we progressed from there to maybe you know having virtual machines on the same physical server then you know moved on to um cloud native arch uh, microservices architecture with cloud native um, tools then we obviously moved on to uh, you know having them in different clouds and um, we're not going to dive too much into the specifics but what containerization and transformation to the uh, microservices based architecture aim to do uh, was to actually lighten the divide uh, between uh, the traditional development and operations team by actually letting developers take um, you know developers worry only about the applications they write uh but that is still not the case uh with containerization we still have to worry about the app app specific libraries bring in web assembly and that last layer gets abstracted away as well and that's why mr hike says or has actually tweeted what he did back in nine, uh, 2019 during the announcement of the wasi spec that if it were existing back then like during the announcement um of docker back in 2008 if i'm not wrong um docker probably we wouldn't have to go through the entire containerization <laughs> kubernetes revolution that we are going through um so what is wasi exactly um like i said before uh, web assembly being a compilation target and a low level language um doesn't have all the frills and fancies that are typically associated with a high level programming one uh map memory network and file system management are some of the absolute basics that you would require when working with a real world application and when you're in a browser um wasm uses the browser apis to do this but like i said uh, it has gone beyond the browser and we would need something to um need something for web assembly to actually interact with the system the actual system 
So in such an environment, prior to the introduction of WASI, uh, there were no standard set of APIs uh, like we have in the browser side so that WASM could use uh, it to interact with the underlying host. The WASI spec sort of gives WebAssembly that capability to do, uh, to do it with the various proposals that are listed on the slide. Um, of course, this is not the only, um, you know, uh, important specification uh, within this uh, ecosystem. But it's one of the inter uh, important ones along with uh, the WebAssembly gateway interface specification, which is mentioned in the very last point. Um, and now that we've spoken a bit about WASI, uh, you'll ap appreciate the component model uh, even more because um, it takes that uh, reusability of code a bit further. Uh, the component model defines an architecture, platform, and language agnostic uh, format for representing executable code. A WebAssembly module uh, may import functions, uh, global variables, etc., from the host uh, runtime and can export that, that to the host. However, there's currently no way to combine modules at runtime. And uh, there is no standard way to actually, um, you know, pass high-level types like strings and no records across module boundaries. The lack of this composition uh, for a module meant that mod means currently not meant means uh, that modules have to be statically linked, and uh, you cannot dynamically link them at runtime, um, and they cannot. Con you know, when we spoke about WebAssembly, the main thing was that we wanted it to be portable. But with, with this thing, uh, with this drawback, it cannot communicate with other modules. And as a result, uh, there's no way for communication um, leading. So because of the lack of communication, there's no um, way it can be portable. Um, the component model basically allows um, for this, um, you know, communication in a standard portable way and the dynamic uh, linking of modules at runtime uh, via provision of three features on top of the core specification. Uh, one is that of the interface type. The second is that of uh, module and component linking. And the third uh, feature is that of the canonical application binary interface. Um, so uh, I've included a link to the, uh, you know, component model um, spec and the WASI spec uh, at the end. So you can peruse that uh, after the slides are up. I promise to put them up by the end of today. But yeah, um, once we speak about uh, the component model, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is where do we run it? Uh, where do we run the things or the applications that we write leveraging WebAssembly? Write once, run anywhere was a dream. We had begun to dream with Java. Uh, it soon transformed to write once, debug everywhere. And uh, with JavaScript, we sort of managed to come a bit closer to the original dream because it was the default programming language for the web. But while running native code in the browser, what tends to happen uh, is that each time the source code gets transcribed to the relevant programming language by a compiler, uh, it leads to a lot of code enlargement. Uh, the workaround is to use a compiler with specific auxiliary functions and uh, based on the different features like uh, WASI support, um, smaller troop, uh, smaller footprint, and true compatibility with the right ones run anywhere um, paradigm, we have all these different runtimes to support WebAssembly currently. And this is not an exhaustive listing because this would probably span like four or five slides currently. So I have just uh, hyperlinked the disk, uh, you know, listing in the slide and it will be available when they are put up. Um, now, next up is a quick look at all the major platforms leveraging WebAssembly to help uh, solve various use cases. Uh, Fermion here, uh, I believe they're there in the 
uh, sponsor showcase as well. Um, they work on uh, WebAssembly uh, powered cloud tools. Um, Suborbital uh, aims to turn anything into a functions as a service fast platform. Uh, Wasm Cloud is a CNCF project here um, and uh, it enables you to write business logic anywhere uh, right from the edge to the cloud. Uh, again, not an exhaustive listing since it's an ever-expanding ecosystem. And um, uh, these are the various compilers available and interesting space to watch out for because um, it's an, uh, it's an inexhaustive list and the complete list uh, with the GitHub link is included at the end with the resources. Um, it's an interesting space to watch out for because a lot of these compilers are currently in the stage uh, wherein you know the work uh, is completed but it's not currently, uh, it's usable but it's unstable. So um, it will be interesting to see how uh, uh, you know work goes on in this particular ecosystem and uh, when we talk about compilers the how can we leave languages far behind because the very first question that gets thrown at me when i speak about anything WebAssembly is what languages are exactly supported today and do we have to actually learn uh, rush to learn WebAssembly? so the answer is no uh, there uh, are um, you know three different types of languages that are currently supported by WebAssembly. Uh, you have like uh, WebAssembly specific languages that have been uh, written specifically, uh, you know, to support WebAssembly. That is, assembly script is, um, by, um, you know, one of the examples. Uh, then you have scripting languages like Python, which now offers support for WebAssembly. And uh, of course, there are higher level uh, languages like C, C++, Rust uh, that have exemplary support for WebAssembly as well. So, no, you do not have to learn Rust uh, for it. But if it's if you do choose to learn it, it's a great language. Um, I previously also think I referenced this uh, uh, transition from um, on-prem dedicated servers to um, uh, you know, a more cloud native um, declarative uh, sort of architecture in the slide with Solomon Hikes. Uh, it's, this is a fantastic pictorial depiction of what exactly, uh, you know, WebAssembly tries to achieve. Um, this is one of the keynotes that was there in the previous year's KubeCon um, cloud native WebAssembly day. And uh, it's actually pretty self-explanatory in the way that, uh, you know, uh, the transition is at least, uh, you know, aiming, I mean, we at least aim to achieve in terms of, you know, the move to WebAssembly. So the last level is what we aim to abstract away. And uh, the whole uh, idea is to tightly couple Cloud Native and WebAssembly so that we can have or uh, we can have that in, uh, you know, the near future. Uh, now, again, uh, not an exhaustive list, um, but I personally work with Cube Burden uh, a bit more, so I can speak to that. Um, so these are some of the projects. There are, um, you know, others that offer support for WebAssembly, like uh, OPA also recently, um, you know, announced. So. I haven't included that here because I had made the slides prior to that. But uh, yeah, so uh, Cubewarden basically is a, a project that leverages uh, WebAssembly so that you can write your Kubernetes policies in whichever language is most comfortable to you. Um, caveat obviously is that uh, the language needs to have a compiler that can translate it to Wasm. Um, but uh, this is again a space that's growing because uh, like I said, that last level of abstraction uh, being removed is an interesting thing for a lot of folks in the cloud native ecosystem and the WebAssembly ecosystem alike. So this is a place you can watch out for in terms of more developments in the future. So where can WebAssembly be actually used um, is the thing now um, because I've spoken a bit about uh, 
what it is, uh, its intersection with cloud native and um, you know the transition and what all languages. But uh, it uh, essentially what we try, what you're trying to do with WebAssembly is that we're taking application code and um, we are trying to have it run anywhere. Whether it's on the edge, whether it's on the web, whether it's on your on-prem systems, if you have any, um, whether it's on your desktop, whether it's on your browser, anywhere. So um, that's the end goal. And uh, we've sort of achieved that. And uh, I think a couple of slides uh, further, you'll be able to see a graphical um, description of where all WebAssembly is being used currently. Uh, but um, there's a small example of how WebAssembly is uh, being used currently uh, in, you know, uh, the space uh, where Flash and Adobe, uh, sorry, Flash and Silverlight used to be, you know, the pioneers. So, uh, Ruffle, which is a WebAssembly powered um, WebGL, actually is the uh, powering, um, uh, powering source behind Flash emulation for Prime Video, Zoom, and Google Meet. And this is not a shout out or anything, but it's just one of the things that I thought was interesting in terms of a real life application. But yeah, this is a whole uh, thing of where all we have um, applications currently. Uh, this, I believe, was made in, I think, 2019 or early 2020. So um, there are far more, uh, you know, branches right now. So I I recently read about Cloudflare uh, supporting WebAssembly as well. So it's, uh, it's not the only, this is not like the only m map but uh, we've gone beyond the web, uh, as is clearly illustrated in this slide. Um, that being said, I am um, almost at the end, so thank you for your patience. Um, so what exactly is the future of WebAssembly and where are we headed? So um, currently, it's not the default compilation target. Uh, let's, uh, it, although it's supported across all the major browsers, it's um, not the default comp uh, compilation target across server-side and client-side applications, sorry, browser-side applications. So the future of uh, WebAssembly is probably, you know, in this direction of becoming the default compilation target to have this port, uh, have like that last layer of abstraction, um, you know, cleared off. Um, and of course, with uh, the component model um, uh, and WASI spec enabling a reusability of code, um, we are looking at uh, more um, standardization around software development and uh, language neutral um, application development as well. Um, so these are some of the community and learning resources um, uh, that you know are prominent in the ecosystem. They're not the only ones though. Um, so uh, wasm.builders is a fantastic place uh, wherein folks actually uh, uh, starting out or experienced are, uh, you know, talking about their uh, applications with WebAssembly, the Bytecode Alliance, um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Confidential Con Computing Consortium, all of a went and the W3C community group, all of a went to neutral homes uh, for you know uh, projects of WebAssembly, and uh, a huge shout out to all these um, learning resources that I actually used when starting off. Um, uh, Lynn Clark's blog in particular is a fantastic resource uh, for anyone trying to get a grasp of what um, the internal workings of WebAssembly are. Um, uh, she explains it in a uh, really, really simplified way. Uh, uh, similarly, with the weekly newsletter that uh, Colin uh, runs, that's another amazing uh, source of, uh, you know, information to keep yourself updated. But uh, I guess that's it from me. And thank you so much uh, for, you know, listening in with all your patience. And I hope you have a fantastic uh, time. Thank you.